Good afternoon to all those who've tuned in. My name is Ankit Malhotra and I'm the president of the Jindal Society of International Law. It is my honor and my privilege to welcome amongst us Professor Ranganathan of Cambridge University. Before I introduce her and hand over the virtual floor to her, uh, I would like to say a few words about the center and the Jindal Society of International Law. The center, uh, the center for UN Studies is spearheaded by Professor Dr. Veselin Popowski, who is also the Vice Dean. The center aims as a project which engages in, in studying the history and the traditions, but also takes a transformative approach to research, teaching, and societal engagement, having in mind latest dynamic geopolitical and technological shifts. Professor Popowski in his uh, lectures and his anecdotes has often shared with me what in 1953, the UN Security General, uh, uh, Secretary General, General said to Govli said to Dag Hamschkold, the second Secretary General arriving in New York. He said, and I quote, welcome Dag to the most impossible job on this earth. The UN often criticized and turned into a scapegoat when states fail to live up to the initial expectations of its founders. But let us also remember what Amshul said famously as, as a response. He said, and I quote, the UN was not created to take us to heaven, but to save us from hell, end quote. The United Nations is a body which is created to act as a medium or a platform where states can come and interact. The society, the Jindal Society of International Law, similarly is a platform for, for young students, scholars, and professors and faculty members in the academy to share their ideas and their visions of what they understand and interpret international law as. Interpretation of international law and a very specific field of interpretation of international law, which is the third world approaches to international law is where Professor Ranganathan finds her beat. Professor Ranganathan's current work traces the co-constitution of international law and the ocean from 1945 to what it stands for now. Unsettling what we take as the givens in relations to the spatial zones, resource allocation and functional jurisdictions affected by the law of the sea. It extends the history and critique of international law into new areas such as ocean depths and bottoms, global commons, marine infrastructure and technological imaginaries. And for the, from the underdeveloped vantage point of ocean lawmaking throws new light on the current preoccupations of international law histories, statehood and territory, decolonization and the new international economic order, the Cold War race and empire and the emergence of new legal forms of institutions. Professor Ranganathan has been educated at NLSIU Bangalore and then as a Vanderbilt scholar at NYU and then at Cambridge as a Gates scholar and a JC Hall scholar at St. John's College. Professor Ranganathan has also clerked at the Supreme Court of India, in turn at the UNHCR, UNICEF and TRI. Professor Ranganathan, it is an absolute honor and a privilege for us to host you. The floor is now yours. The, I must use the buzzword of the 21st century. You're still on mute. <laughs> oh gosh, this is, you know, one of those things you never, you somehow never develop the habit of, of doing after years of, after almost, you know, a year of practice. But in any case, good afternoon to all of you. Greetings from Cambridge. And a huge thanks to Ankit Manotha, especially for the invitation to be here. I'm looking forward to talking to all of you about my research. And what I'm going to do is Building on what Ankit just said, is, uh, I will sketch out in quite a broad way some of the things that I have been thinking about in relation to the law of the sea. As Ankit mentioned, my work explores the co-constitution of the ocean and the international legal order in the 20th century. Um, in other words, I examine the ways in which the ocean has served as a site, as a context, and as a catalyst for international order making or world making and also, conversely, how these very projects of international ordering have shaped the ocean itself. So this is the broad sort of area in which I'm working at the moment, and I'll say more about this 
And more importantly, I'd like to emphasize today why I think it is important and rewarding to work with the law of the sea, which I think is really a field of a subfield of international law that has been left far too much to one side. It's seen as really the concern only of certain specialists. But what I'm going to try to do today is talk to you about why it is rewarding to think about the law of the sea as part of the general history and the general political economy of international law. So I'm going to try to do this in about half an hour or so, so it has to leave some time for discussion afterwards. Okay, now let's start with just looking at the title slide. There is an image that you see on this slide, and you might be wondering what this image is. It is a very beautiful graphic, but what does it represent? This is a graphic representation of Concept 3, which was a project by Jacques Cousteau. Jacques Cousteau was a filmmaker, an inventor, an oceanographer, a French naval officer. And this was one in a series of efforts by him to test the feasibility of placing humans in the sea for long periods. Cousteau thought that if successful, this would facilitate not only the extraction of resources, but also the study of marine life. So this was a prototype that he had developed in 1965. Costus was one effort, but it was not the only such effort. So if we go to the next slide, we'll see many other plans that were drawn up, uh, for marine human habitats. So in the 1950s, 60s, and 70s, we saw plans developed by navies. You see a picture of the US uh, Navy Sea Lab project. There were plans developed by scientists. So there was the Tektite project, which is the one that you see in the blue. And visionary architects like Buckminster Fuller, Shoji Sadao, Kiyonori Kikutake, and others developed plans for marine cities, cities on the sea, again in the 60s. In broad world historical terms, these decades, the 50s, 60s, 70s, where all of these plans for human habitation were being drawn up, we think of these as the period of the Cold War and or the period of decolonization. But as these images show you, they were also, and precisely sometimes in relation to these frames of Cold War and decolonization, years in which future human engagements with the oceans were richly imagined. I've told you about plans for human habitation, but there are, of course, other hopes too. And the next slide shows you some of these. So there was the hope of feeding the whole world sufficient protein at the cost of less than a rupee per person per day. I'm going to move to the next slide. You'll see a picture of that. Yes, there we are. Thank you. So this is the idea of fish protein concentrate, one spoonful of which was supposed to provide every person with enough protein that they would need for the day. And it was thought that this would be a revolution because a box of fish protein concentrate would, cost, would last you a whole month and cost you only a few rupees. There was the plan for recovering ocean, the ocean's mineral resources, including nodules from the deep floor of the deep sea bed but of course also a whole variety of other minerals from the continental shelf. And most importantly, of course, was the hope which has been realized of oil extraction at greater and greater depths. Uh, one of the things we saw happen in these decades in the 1960s was the perfection of the deep sea drilling ship, which allowed people to, allowed the imagination of oil extraction to really soar much beyond the building of uh, sort of permanent platforms on continental shelf. So all this is to say that the ocean loomed really large in the political and economic imagination of the period. And yet, in current histories of the time, when we write histories of the period, histories of international law or international politics or political economy even, the ocean somehow falls outside the picture. The focus is overwhelmingly on land and land-related developments. So a few examples on the next slide include, for example, Timothy Mitchell's book, which is a book about the materialities of oil production and distribution, but it does not discuss the implications of much oil being located offshore. Okay, can we move to the next slide? Yes. 
Then you have, for example, Orne, or Arne Westad's book, which is a book about the global Cold War, a wonderful book that takes us, takes us look at the Cold War not just as it was taking place in the capitals in the USSR and the USA, but also what it meant for countries around the world. And yet this is a book that only has very, very scattered mentions of the oceans, a few scattered mentions of naval actions and a few quotes. Mark Mazawa's work, which is a panoptic account of political and legal developments in the period, including the development of the United Nations, makes only one reference each to the Law of the Sea negotiations and the Law of the Sea Convention of 1982. So in short, these are all great works, and they are certainly essential reads for anyone interested in thinking about the history of the 20th century, but they do leave the impression that the ocean and its ordering were rather peripheral to the moment. And that, unfortunately, is also the impression that the UN itself seems to convey in the ways in which it shows you, it represents what, what decolonization is. So for example, the UN offers these two maps that uh, together show you decolonization. You see them on the next slide. Uh, I have to, at this point, I should stop and apologize. So we are having, uh, so, uh, there is a, I mean, Ankit has had to, for various technical reasons, had to manage the slideshow for me. So there's a slight lag. I hope you would forgive us that. Think of this as the kind of lag that happens when you're watching Netflix and the internet slows down and the image doesn't buffer as quickly as the sound does. All right, so coming back to these maps. Now you will see here that the UN tries to show you in a snapshot decolonization. It shows you in the first map what the world looked like in 1945. In the second map, what the world looks like today. And the image, the impression it conveys is that the transition has been a move from empires to states. But these maps leave the ocean unchanged. The ocean was a blank in 1945, and the ocean is left a blank now. So there is a, a gesture here, a suggestion that nothing much has changed on the sea, even though the changes have been major on land. And in this, by the way, the UN is simply following a map making tradition that had emerged from the 17th century onwards, erasing on the maps all of the intensifying navigational uses of the sea for the slave trade, for colonialism, and so forth. Now, in fact, and contrary to the UN's representation of, uh, the, of the Black Sea, in this period, in the, and especially in the course of the mid 20th century, from between 1945 and 1982, the transformations of the world were not just not confined to land, they were remarkable on the sea. The ocean was extensively defined, bounded, and occupied. And I'm going to walk you through now a series of more representative maps. So the next slide will show you um, how what political boundaries were well, the political boundaries that were actually created. They were extended, as you can see here, far into the ocean. So in this map, and you see all the blue and orange bits were, are actually areas that were brought within national jurisdiction. Only the gray bits were left at the high seas. The next slide will show you a version of this map, but in its specific exposure. So again, when we see these images of the open Pacific, what we're not seeing is the ways in which a large part of the Pacific uh, Ocean and its floor has been brought within the national jurisdiction of states. The next map will also show you some lines that have been etched in the international seabed area. So what you see, these yellow bits, are essentially uh, areas of the international seabed that are under contracts for exploration of seabed minerals. So they're controlled by various consortiums, various corporations. The next map shows you, again, lines in the high seas and in the international seabed areas. These are areas that are under the jurisdiction of fisheries management organizations or areas that have been classified as marine protected areas. So they are controlled. All of these maps show you lines that strike the open ocean, that bring parts of it within the jurisdiction or control of states or of international organizations or even effectively of corporations. And this is still not a full picture because there are other things that occupy the sea. So the next map will be a map of submarine cables. And as you know, uh, as you would already know from uh, your discussions or from, or from recent news, submarine cables control 99% of the world's communications. So when we think of satellite communications, we often think of 
these communications happening via things that move in space. Actually, quite a lot of what we're doing, even our conversation now, is facilitated by thin tubes that run across the sea. The next map is a map of shipping routes, and it shows you the directions in which shipping goes. Again, the whole world is essentially integrated, made into one world through the expansion of international shipping. The next map after this offers you a greater idea of the density of international shipping. So each of these little arrows is essentially a ship. And you can see uh, that the ocean is really not a very lonely place at all. There's quite a lot of activity on it. And really, again, you don't need me to tell you this. The Suez crisis of, our, of the previous month gave you some idea of what happens when even one choke point gets uh, shut off for about a day or two. The next map is a map of plastics. So each dot that you see here is 20 kilos of plastic. Some place, in some places you see the dots are so concentrated as to almost look like they create solid compacted wastes. And this is the fear that is driving a lot of uh, environmental movements at the moment or our fantasies of trash islands. Uh, the thing of mountains and mountains of trash in the Pacific, in the Atlantic, in the Indian Ocean, sometimes exceeding the size in just in geographical terms of Germany or France, or three, or, you know, three times the size of France, etc. The next map is a map that tries to bring some of these things together. So you see here, and if we, if you bring in all the animations, we see this is marine protected areas, uh, uh, seabed mining contracts, but overlay this with, uh, and I'll give you just move, if you add all the animations, you'll see the rest of it as well. That's cables, and on top of that is shipping, and then on top of that is plastic waste. I guess what you begin to see here is really an ocean that is not, no longer the kind of blank, empty space that the UN map shows you, but something that is much more crowded. And even this, by the way, is not the whole story, because I haven't put here maps uh, that reflect the future lines, the lines that might be drawn that are being discussed right now in the context of ongoing discussions, both on seabed mining, but also importantly on a new international treaty that seeks to regulate biodiversity beyond national jurisdiction and seeks to expand area-based management tools. And so I haven't put, so there'll be fresh uh, areas of enclosure or fresh areas of control extended across the ocean. And there are also projects in, that are being discussed, in, including at the UN itself around, again, creating uh, sustainable marine habitats in the ocean. So there are, for example, the sea steading projects of the Silicon Valley Libertarians, but the UN has also been exploring floating cities projects and, and what sorts of solutions they might offer for uh, when climate change happens and sea levels begin to rise and land becomes more uh, becomes at a greater premium than it does at the moment. So we are seeing, so we already have an ocean that is incredibly crowded, looking to become even more crowded as various plans for unlocking the blue economy and for unlocking blue growth rectify. In sum, over the 20th century, and frankly, even before the 20th century, I could show you maps in the 19th century as well, uh, that would track shipping, whaling, and a whole bunch of other activities. What we've always had is an ocean that is rather crowded. When you compare it to the blank that it is often represented, you begin to see that map making and representations, uh, artistic representations of the ocean are not just about art, they're also about politics, right? There is a politics to presenting a space that is so extensively occupied, worked with, exploited, and traversed as somehow empty. So it is this crowded ocean that informs my project of integrating into the history and political economy of international law, the efforts that have gone into defining and bounding the ocean and regulating and distributing its resources, mobility, and managing its ecologies. And there are at least three important points to consider, I think. Firstly, the ocean as itself. The ocean as we know it and as we encounter it today is legally constructed. It is a creature of international law. 
much of which evolved from 1945 onwards with the adoption of the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea in 1982 being a specific landing point. And, and you'll see a picture from the negotiations in the next slide. The UN Convention is called, yes, this, this slide. The UN Convention on the Law of the Sea of 1982 is often called the Constitution for the Ocean. And it certainly did constitute the ocean. It was developed over a long period. So it developed over 10 years of formal negotiations, several years <coughs> of preparatory work, and building on earlier UN conferences on the law of the sea of the 50s and 60s. And this whole process was an ordering process that transformed an unknown space, the unknown space of the oceans, barely visited, barely seen, barely understood into one that was seemingly entirely comprehended by legal categories. So the UNCLOS divided the sea by zones, and you'll see that on the next slide. It divided the sea by medium, uh, seabed versus water column. It classified all of the contents of the ocean as falling into one or the other of the zones. So you see a whole bunch of resources that were distributed across the ocean. And it enacted legal fictions that would simplify the space, deciding, for example, that sedentary species would include crustacean species that we actually know can swim, and many other such fictions. In these ways, it sorted the complex and interconnected ecosystems of the ocean into discrete resource sites. It created conditions for resource exploitation, and it also gave extraction a normative head. This was clearly the case also, particularly the case with seabed minerals, which as you will see on the next slide, were framed as realizing the idea of the common heritage of mankind. And importantly, the UN even compensated through the UNCLOS, uh, at, I mean, and at the states at the UN even compensated at the, through the UNCLOS for the lack of actual technologies by anticipating them, by creating as if regime. So the entire regime of seabed mining in particular was created in advance of any actual workable, commercially viable technology for seabed mining. This legal construction, this making of the ocean as a space of discrete resources, as an exploitable space, as a controllable space, was also the ocean's unmaking. The ocean was unmade as a communal space, as a space, as a commons. It was unmade in terms of other ontologies. So indigenous worldviews, for example, or Polynesian imaginaries of the ocean or imaginaries that had prevailed even around the Indian Ocean, um, in the Bay of Bengal and other places. These were disappeared under the universalizing logic of the Anglos. And the ocean was also unmade as a place of complex ecosystems, as a place of life. <clears throat> so one of the ironies is that even as plans for human habitation of the ocean were being formulated, what was being ignored were all of these other forms of life that actually occupy the very spaces that the humans were now thinking of colonizing in the 1950s and 60s. So this process of oceanic lawmaking and ocean unmaking is a fascinating one. And this is the third thing to keep in mind. So the first thing to keep in mind is that the ocean is legally constructed. The second thing to keep in mind is that this legal construction was also an unmaking. But the third thing to keep in mind is the point about international law. The process of this lawmaking and ocean unmaking is fascinating and it deserves much greater study than it receives because there are many ways in which it can illuminate the histories of international law and of international auditing. Amongst other things, the process reveals the making and unmaking of various political geographies. It reveals the flourishing and then vanishing of a variety of political economies. And it reveals various visions, again, their flourishing and then their foreclosure, various visions of international law itself. So let's take a quick look at each. In terms of geography, Let's look at what light the UNCLOS can show political geography. There is, of course, the plain fact that the law of the sea gave a legal definition to the physical geography of the ocean. The ocean's geography was not very well known. It hadn't really, to a large extent, it remains under study. What the UNCLOS had to do is, what the UNCLOS did was it essentially remade 
in part, the very geographies it claimed to reflect in creating various zones. So one example is the uniform definition that we have of the continental shelf. As you see on these maps of the ocean floors of uh, the Atlantic sea floor, the Pacific sea floor, and the Indian Ocean sea floor, the continental shelf is actually a widely varied feature. It is not, the uh, UNCLOS idealizes it as a natural prolongation of land, of state territory, of course, or, or of the territory of the coast. That's mostly not the case in, in, a, in large parts of the world where the continental shelf can be an abruptly plunging uh, feature. It can be entirely discontinuous. It can be detached from the coasts and so on. All of these differences were smoothened out in legal language which reflects the continental shelf as a kind of uniform, regular feature that occurs across the world. It meant, so it meant remaking in part various geographies of the sea, but it also meant embracing concepts that would make sense of the emerging political self-definitions of states. So the period over which the law of the sea consolidated was a time of the emergence of many new states from colonization, we know this, and unsurprisingly, a key and fraught issue was the working out of the territorial boundaries. This also we know. What sometimes gets ignored is that this was then also a moment in which a wide range of states were imagining the seaward extents. And this was a particular existential issue for island states, for archipelagic states, many of which were seeking the recognition that they were a sea of islands, to use a fairly Hawafa's term, rather than just islands scattered in the sea. So Fiji, for example, which you see on the slide, would say it's not just the brown splotches of land that you see, but also the waters around. So the actual, when you, have, when you imagine Fiji, you have to imagine it as the large, larger light gray entity and not just as the, as the little splashes of land. Uh, this is, again, an imagination that had to be then worked into in certain, it had to be accommodated to some extent in the unclosed. Uh, for vis a vis some states, denied for others. Kiribati, for example, does not get to think of itself as an archipelago in the same way. Um, so, this was, uh, but clearly, UNCLOS had to develop legal concepts to accommodate this archipelagic imagination. And this meant working again with uh, fiction. Uh, one of the things that had to be done and was done in the UNCLOS was qualifying various fluid or amphibious features as either land or sea. And UNCLOS is replete with definitions that try to represent the one or the other. So in certain cases, what is water can be configured as land for the purposes of drawing baselines or calculating land and water ratios or for other purposes. The point here is that thinking with the kinds of fictitive legal definitions that the UNCLOS is developing helps to do two things. One, it helps to denaturalize the representations of political boundaries as somehow forged on political realities. As we see, very often physical realities are being remade to comport instead with political boundaries. And this becomes important, especially as we begin to think about what sea level rise will do to existing low lying lands. But it's also important, of course, to think about in the context of all the boundary conflicts that we are privy to across the world. The second thing it helps us to see is that lawmaking is an act of legal engineering. It, in transforming land into water, water into land through legal definition, but also in transforming land, water, and mixtures into property and into sovereign territory. And a really good account of this in the Indian context, if you'd like to read it, is the Jani Bhattacharya's book, Empire and Ecology in the Bengal Delta which looks at how the law succeeds in essentially the law does the work of engineering. It effectively drains the delta and turns it into land, into property. Now, UNCLOS does, so UNCLOS has done a lot in terms of remaking the spatial geographies of the world, but it also shines a light on the formation and the resilience of associated political geographies. So at UNCLOS negotiations, major, so the major associated geographies of the time, the north-south geography, the east-west geography, etc., were severely tested as negotiating blocks regularly cut across these groupings. For example, one of the groups that developed was a group of landlocked and geographically disadvantaged states, which had some western states, some third world states, and so forth. There were huge 
tensions within established groups like the G77 or the group of African states and many others, including dissensions within the group of Western states, as relationships with the sea and with the sea's resources complicated land-based geopolitics. So UNCLOS helps us to see this period as a time of complex alliances and complex enmities. And to say this is not to take away from the conceptions of the third world or of the global south, but really to think about the struggle that went into maintaining Southern solidarities against the competing attractions of other interest-based geographies. So maintaining solidarity, South-South solidarity, third world solidarity was not an illusory thing. It was in fact something that was maintained against the pull of other specific interests. And the UNCLOS is a wonderful, the process of negotiating it is a wonderful illustration of this. All right, so that's for geography. Let's look at political economy now. Um, what about uh, the law of the sea in that context? Now, there is no doubt that the mid 20th century was a period of quite strong consensus that natural resources, including ocean resources, were there to be extracted. So this everybody agreed that extraction was essential. It was an essential building block of development. Various models of development, or the, the models of the paths to development that were to be followed also remain relatively unquestioned across this time. An UNCLOS, when the, the, the conference to negotiate the UNCLOS, when it was convened, was described by many in a tongue-in-cheek way as really not a conference on constitution making or anything like that, but really just a conference on property and resources. So all of this is a given. But the 50s, 60s, and 70s were also a period where an extraction, an extractive conception lent itself to various models of extraction. And this was particularly true in the case of the law of the sea, where numerous proposals were made to embed the extraction of resources within more distributed than just regimes. These proposals included internationalizing the extraction of oil, of fisheries, of seabed minerals. Uh, similar ideas came from many quarters that would place the extractive activities such as oil extraction or, fishery, or fishing or mineral extraction under international administration. They would create, these ideas were to create frameworks for redistributing the revenues from such activities to level up the opportunities for third world states to participate in both the administration of these activities and in the extraction. And the ideas were to exchange the competitive systems that we have now, where uh, essentially different groups, different corporations compete uh, with each other to exploit these resources, to replace such systems for essentially monopolies that would be run by international organizations. And seabed mining is, of course, the major example of this. So we know that the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea has been much lauded by some and criticized by others for classing seabed minerals as the common heritage of mankind and for trying to condition their extraction on the distribution of benefits. And I say trying because what we, we know that much of what was agreed in 1982 was subsequently written out in 1994. So the UNCLOS succeeded, people say, up to a point, but then it was unwritten. All of these concessions were, as, as R.P. Anand had put it in one of his essays, what was achieved was mutilated in, 19, in 1982. What was achieved in 1982 was mutilated in 1994. But what many don't recognize, and this is the point that Professor Chimney had made even in 1982 in essays that he had written on the UNCLOS, was that the 1982 agreement itself was a huge compromise by the third world. It was in fact well before 1982, in the early 70s, before even the formal demands for a new international economic order were articulated, that we saw more radical possibilities emerge at the UNCLOS for the sharing of the benefits of seabed minerals. So in contrast to the current regime, which you see on the slide before you, which privileges mining by private actors and embraces a competitive model that really puts pressure on making mining commercially viable, in the 70s, the major suggestion was to carry out deep seabed mining via an enterprise a name that had been chosen because uh, many of those who were proposing it were fans of the series, the Star Trek series um, uh, about the space enterprise. Uh, the enterprise was meant to be an international public sector undertaking 
Again, the idea was that it would be administered by an international agency, that the participants would include both first world, uh, second world, and third world states, and that the revenues generated by its mining would be uh, redistributed. So the idea was that we don't really need to pursue the goal of commercial viability because seabed mining can accomplish so many other ends. It can accomplish the end of supply security, so secure as many minerals as are actually needed. It can accomplish the end of making third world states partners in a new high tech activity. And it can accomplish the a sort of a mining operation, the, the, the a scale of mining that is exactly in proportion to need and not to sort of a profit. So we can, through, uh, through a model of the enterprise, we can limit the number of mining operations by limiting contracts to considerations that are not profit considerations, considerations that are better for the ecology and better from the point of view of, the, of distribution. The appearance of such proposals uh, in the early 70s and then they're falling away gradually over that decade in favor of what we have now, the present day regimes that again are exemplified on the slide in front of you, is an example of how alternative political economies bubbled and subsided in this period. And again, keep in mind that seabed mining is one example. Such ideas also flourished and died with respect to fishing and with respect to oil extraction. This is again, it shows us that there was within a broad sort of extractive imaginary. A, a whole range of thinking around the ways in which extraction could be accomplished. And the fact that it sort of it arose and died in this period is instructive of the turn in international law more broadly. So one, one of the ways in you might think of UNCLOS and the ocean as a kind of microcosm for understanding all the political economic turns that global economic order really took during this period. All right, so that's geography and political economy, I'm going to close with talking a little bit about the third thing, which is about how ideas, different ideas of international law itself flourished and died in this period. So the period, so the epistemic churn that took place and how it was, uh, how it was foreclosed. So again, we know some of this already from other work as well, right? We have seen particularly Trail scholars, scholars of the third world approaches to international law have talked about efforts that third world states had made to try to alter the conception of sources of international law in the period, particularly to elevate general assembly resolutions to the status of uh, an authoritative source of international law, but also the efforts that they had made to internationalize certain issues, internationalize, for example, the regulation of corporations, again, something that didn't succeed internationalize uh, or to domesticate certain issues, domesticate, for example, uh, the, uh, the regulation of foreign investments, and again, did not succeed, right? So on a whole range of issues, if proposals were made, efforts were made to try to change international laws, sources or substance, and these efforts failed. The UNCLOS uh, example is one of how the multilateral treaty conference was experimented with, and again, not uh, the, the, the dream didn't quite match with the reality. So UNCLOS was also the negotiations of it were an effort to alter who gets to say what international law is, what are the reference points for international law, what are the necessary logics that the law must accord with, what the protocols of lawmaking must be like, and so forth. Um, and it had, it was a conference, so the, the negotiations are particularly prominent because they differed in key respects from many other lawmaking efforts, both lawmaking efforts that had gone before with respect to the law of the sea itself and with respect to other things, including negotiations around them setting up the, the UN itself. They also differed with from many other lawmaking initiatives of the time. How did they differ? In many ways. One, it was a much bigger conference, the much bigger negotiation than, had, than anything else that had been seen up to that point. More than 150 states participated, uh, more than 5,000 people participated in the negotiations. Newly independent Asian and African states were present in great numbers and held key positions in the conference structure. This was also part of this hope of really a sort of post-colonial, uh, you know, this was really, UNCLOS was supposed to be exemplar of post-colonial lawmaking and built into its structure racial justice. So it was meant to be brown and black figures who were to take the lead uh, in, in negotiating its provisions. 
The proceedings were meant not to be based on preparatory work by any expert body, such as the International Law Commission, which tends to be slightly conservative in what it acknowledges to be international law. But also, the proceedings were not meant to be based on work done by a more limited group of states. So the International CBEC Committee that did some of the preparatory work was actually expanded inside in scope. And a clear decision was made that the UNCLOS would be negotiated in Toto at, uh, amongst the 150 states attending, not given over to a committee of 80 or 20 or 25 states, as for example, has been the case with nuclear governance, where the 18 nation disarmament committee does most of the preparatory work. There was also an explicit intention to marry, or at least, or even perhaps subordinate, the idea of efficiency, the logic of efficiency, to actually the ideal of economic justice. So it was very clear at the start of the UNCLOS that what was to be emphasized was political bargaining, not technical decision making. So political justice, equity, uh, distribution, these were the considerations that were supposed to guide the, the spirit of the lawmaking not uh, fidelity to existing uh, legal procedures or existing legal forms, not uh, what not uh, so it, not um, expertise in codification, none of that. And UNCLOS was an experiment also in seeing the ways in which non-state voices, particularly various NGO coalitions representing environmental interests, political economic interests, and even religious interests, were to have participation in this lawmaking. So the, the, the promise at the start was really about thinking of what the shape of post-colonial lawmaking could be and in what ways a multilateral treaty making exercise could serve as the cementing ground of the new international economic order. The process of the UNCLOS, however, and when you start studying the negotiations, it starts with all of these hopes and, and sort of ambitions. But when the process shows you how the hopes emerge, flower for a bit and then fall away. What is a participatory exercise or meant to be a massively participatory exercise disappears into side rooms and secret meetings. The bottom lines change from political and distributive to economic and legal cons conservatism or so-called moderation as the term was uh, the, that, of, that was in vogue at the time reasserted itself against ideas that were dismissed as being too radical. So by weird combination of circumstances, what happened was that, so the, and all of these were things that were noticed at the time and were criticized by third world voices, but by weird combination of circumstances, the negotiations that critical voices, for example, uh, Mohammed Dajawi, uh, but many, uh, Professor Chinni and many others, the, they were beginning to criticize these negotiations, but and they were shaking their heads over what had happened for them. UNCLOS was a kind of tragedy. It was a betrayal of the initial hopes. But it began to be read as a huge third world victory. And this had a lot to do with changes in the US and the UK at the time. The US, especially under the Reagan administration, began to think of multilateral lawmaking itself as a kind of socialist plot. And the UNCLOS itself especially so. It refused to sign the treaty, as did the UK, as did uh, West Germany. Uh, and this the, this, the fact that these states so obviously reneged on the UNCLOS, and the fact that third world states and um, that the third world states didn't, has ended up creating a kind of narrative in retrospect in which the UNCLOS, the 1982 treaty, is seen as a kind of victory for the third world. And then only its amendments in 1994 are seen as sort of then catering to the interests of the first world. But actually what we see is uh, when we look clo more closely at what happens between the start of the negotiation and at the end of the negotiations is a more complex story. Why all of this is important is if you flash forward to the present, as we do in this very final slide, we see again, this is a period, as I've already mentioned, of ongoing lawmaking around the oceans, ongoing lawmaking on questions of seabed mining, on questions of marine generic resources, on questions of biodiversity conservation and the like. This is also 2021 marks the start of the decade of, the, of ocean exploration. Uh, again, which are supposed to be which are supposed to facilitate and be facilitated by the UN. But the present negotiations and present engagements with the oceans are marked by the epistemic closure that took place over the course of the 70s. So what we have now is really 
what we see now is the, in, at these negotiations and in terms of what it seems possible to say and not say in them is really the immutability of the extractive imaginary, the sense that, of course, there are ecological concerns that have to be factored in, but nothing that is agreed should undermine or, or uh, sort of depart from the consensus over the model of extraction that had, that was sort of uh, reached over the course of the 80s, of the, at the end of the 70s and the 80s, and then sort of consolidated by in the 1990s. So, uh, which means that it which leaves you wondering if you are sitting in one of these rooms about well, what really these new, this supposedly new ocean treaty is going to look like if it if it can't overturn any of these aspects of the older agreement. So to wrap up then, the law of the sea and its history is important to look at for the ocean itself and for putting in context what is going on right now in ocean governance. But also it is critical to understanding how international law has come to code political economies. What are the possibilities that have been erased in the making of the current order? And where again we need to go if we want to discover the path that was not taken then, but was seen as closer to visions of justice, especially for the third world. I'm going to stop here and I look forward to your comments and questions. Thank you. Well, we'll keep the slides on since they've been very kindly and very uh, uh, tactfully designed for us. Uh, Professor, thank you so much for your address. Um, you've given us a perspective and a lot of food for thought. Uh, I do have a couple of reflections which I would like to share and then open it up for questions later on. Um, and this perhaps gives a good, uh, at least I hope it gives a good perspective on what Professor is trying to convey in terms of how uh, this this topic of colonization, subsequent decolonization should be understood. Professor uh, in her article uh, classifies the the convention as the uh, microcosm of rulemaking in an, an essential part of how it has been understood since time and how colonizations, well, this decolonization played a part in this project and how did the group of 77 nations refer uh, or at least work in this and the different caucuses which operated in the uh, ILC while this, this project was undertaken and the undercurrents essentially which ran in this project of uh, <clears throat> at least in some senses having a new colonial approach towards classifying each area of the ocean as a designated area with designated rights and also liabilities. Um, one interesting point that I have noted while reading was that the Atlantic Treaty also offered this kind of uh, geopolitical imagination, which was contained and how equitable consideration was given to all claimants of the region and you have players like uh, Norway and, and even Germany and even the British having claims in the uh, Antarctic, which is the exact, quite literally the, the, the other side of the globe. Uh, it, with respect to geography at least, but you do understand or have a deeper understanding of colonialism and how it worked in, 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 in two aspects of really might is right and how the first claimants in a first come first serve basis it worked. Um, another and last point I, I, I would like to highlight is how Professor calls, uh, and in fact quotes Arvind Pardo and when, when, when he says that dolphins acting as sheepdogs and air air bubble uh, curtains would protect fish, fish ranges and colonies of aquanauts would line up in the depths. I think that's good analysis of how prototype cities as Professor Ranganathan calls them and the sea colonization would work. And she, she gives two perspectives of the oceans which she's also highlighted in her talk. And she says that the oceans are the rubbish dump, which is a fact is that the oceans are the rubbish dump on the world, but however, are still by far the most important storehouses of resources and also transport. And we are all witness to the fact of one small catastrophe can cause a massive delay in supply chains and uh, trade. Right, um, I would now like questions if, 
uh, if if there are any i don't see any uh, right now so perhaps i'll take this as as the opportunity to ask the first question uh perhaps i i do understand the common heritage of mankind and i also study this in a different form when it is applied to space and the outer space treaty so, uh, so and you see the enterprise working as in the oceans but you also see perhaps i would like to see seek your perspective as a, a sea altern as a space alternative to the to the enterprise perhaps would you classify the itu as being the reasonable choice or or would you have a different perspective on that you mean uh, the itu for something like the sea or the itu you mean the itu for telecommun for space or you mean the well, space, well i mean i mean the the you have the enterprise which is the 70s creation and even the name rings a bell i mean us gen z would not classify anything as the enterprise it sounds very 70s so i mean you have this you have this product of the 70s the enterprise but would you classify in the same vein of form the itu for the space as as this overarching figure to to control and would you also feel that it is as will it be as effective as the enterprise which again under the 1994 agreement was sort of diluted so there are differences i think it's a good question because one of the things that was of course going on in the 50s and 60s was thinking about different existing regimes that could serve as the model for designing institutions for the seas and the itu which is a function specific but overarching sort of regulatory body did provide did serve as a as one possible model that could be used for the sea what happened was uh, that the discussions took a different turn right so one of the things that happened for the sea we have not actually seen it happen for space and that has to do a lot with the geographies and the relative ease of access to both places and the relative sort of understanding of hopes we have of them is that the sea well the 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 argument for dividing the ocean according to sort of its various functions uh, geography zones mediums etc grew stronger and the arguments over so one of the major arguments that was sort of right at the time was well okay so if we even if we agree to all of these divisions should they should the different parts of the ocean be controlled by one body or many and if many then how should we decide on the relative functions of these bodies and the relations to each other should there be a hierarchy should there be some kind of common framework that holds them all together what we saw happening was the emergence for the sea bed of a kind of absolute authority so the international sea bed authority uh, actually administers a whole range of functions in relation to sea bed it facilitates ocean exploration it regulates mining it's meant to now think about regulating sort of the protection of the, of the ecology of the sea floor but its functions were weirdly confined in two respects one was exactly and this brings back, us back to what you were saying about the itu was submarine cables so they really don't fit into the functions of the international sea bed authority and necessitate constant sort of jostling between uh cable companies and agencies that represent cable companies and what and the, the sort of informal regulatory bodies that have been set up in respect to cable companies and the international cyber authority but also the international cyber authority's uh, ability to manage anything about the ocean that is even a few feet away from the bed of the sea is brought into question right so one of the things we don't know yet is to what extent will the international cyber authority be able to say anything at all about hydrothermal vents and the resources within that so they can regulate the minerals of the hydrothermal vents but the microbes and the micro and the entire and the ecosystems that flourish in these vents might possibly be placed under a completely different regime through the action of the dbg negotiations so what i mean to say is that the ocean has been rendered into something that is simultaneously very complex in terms of how the the rights to administer it have been distributed and also something very simple because this has been done to essentially simplify some of these places for extraction it's much easier to carry on with the work of extraction if you can just remove from your mental imagination of the ocean all the things that complicate your access to minerals right including the presence of a whole variety of uh, life forms or uh, ecologies in the ocean so the itu in a sense was it's also from a different time uh, the imagination that guides it is necessarily It's, it's a it's a constructive imagination, but a simpler one, which is simply because 
the kinds of hopes that are vested in the ocean are not actually vested in space. I'm not referring here, of course, to Elon Musk's sort of, you know, hopes to one day colonize Mars and so on. But there is a difference between, so these two mediums are often thought of together, space and sea, but they are vastly different mediums because the one is the repository and, and it has and it's quite different in terms of who accesses it and how and in what terms and who has imagined it for a long time, uh, which is the ocean from space which is actually rarefied, not just physically, but also in terms of the, the kinds of imaginations that have been associated with it. Professor, I want to sort of take you back and challenge this idea of, of the, at least the Global South acting as the treaty maker in, in the law of the sea specifically, because there's an alternate view which would suggest uh, no, it's a European project again. It's a European creation again. And it's really us merchant nations who've controlled and conceived this. And this is something that, I mean, we've had Professor, uh, well, we've had, we have Sir Michael Wood speak about as well. And he refers to this again, and he doesn't do it explicitly, but he does pay homage to this idea that the the UNCLOS is the project of European nations and nations who've acted as these powerful seafaring nations. So how, how do you uh, reconcile with this apparent tension which exists between developing nations acting as a, a strong stronghold on at least this convention vis-a-vis uh, -vis the idea that this again being a European uh, uh, offspring? Because, no, you see, I mean, I because, because you see, because you see, it's far more deeper than than what really happened in in the 1970s. Because it's really based on what Hugo Grotius did in Mare Claus and Mare Liberum, right? It, those are the real roots of what we have now. So there is some sort of a, a tilt towards this being a European idea. And of course, why did even Grotius do all that? Because this was challenged as as a project of the Dutch East India Company. So that the, the roots exist, but would you, would you uh, uh, reconcile with this fact or would you say that, no, it's really a project wherein the G77 really took hold and this was supported because of the decolonization movement? Oh no, I don't think I say that in any of my writings either or even in what I said today. The, the thing, the point I was trying to make and maybe I can remake it for, for clarity was two things. The one, of course, you're quite right, the, the law of the sea in terms of how it has developed historically, but also in the course of the 20th century, if we take a step back and look at it, is a European project, right? So of course, it, it, I mean, we don't, so we can go back to the time of Grotius and talk about how my librum arises is, a, is, an, is an ideal that arises in the context of the particular interests of the Dutch East India Company uh, uh, and uh, written in the defense of the actions of the of the sort of the capture of the Santa Catalina by representatives of the East India Company, Grotius develops this idea of the free sea essentially to argue against the Portuguese idea uh, of uh, an ocean that had been sort of divided into two between Spain and Portugal and allocated sides of it had been allocated to these two countries for discovering navigational routes and trading with the Indians, right? So this is this is an old imaginary. One of the mistakes people make is in somehow then, uh, in as, one of the things we should not mistake though is in thinking that the Grotian imaginary was the only thing that formalized the notion of the free sea. In fact, the reason the free sea had remained under this idea of the Mare Librum remained a stable idea has a lot to do with British imaginations of the ocean as they developed in the 17th and 18th century. So it's it's really not so much Grotius himself had was forced to argue against some of his ideas to the British, which is a, a few years after he articulated after he wrote Mare Librum. It's the British who were getting, who were gathering naval strength, who for whom this idea of ruling the waves worked very well alongside the idea of free sea. But then the British Empire was, we must remember, at its start, essentially an empire of trade, right? Of moving things from one place to the other and therefore integrating all of the world into this one economic system. But let's set all of these things aside and look at the 20th century. Here also, if we now take a step back, and this is the point I was making, if we now look at what happened at the conclusion of the Antwerp negotiations, if we look at the convention that was actually agreed in 1982, 
it was a convention that where the third world had been forced to compromise a lot a lot of the ideas a lot of the expectations of the third world had got un gone unfulfilled not only in terms of substance but also in terms of process what is interesting to me however is that at their start and this is not so much the case with the first or the second conferences in the law of sea but this, at the start of the third conference there was a hope or a sense that what we would see is actually a departure from these usual expectations right so we have a very western law of the sea a law of the sea that had also succeeded in actually eradicating other imaginations of the ocean or other associations with the ocean and this was seen as a chance to rewrite some of this uh, and also along the way to experiment with modes of law making and styles of negotiation that would actually better accord with third world interests it's the eradication of the erasure of these over that 10 or 15 year period that is interesting to study right so we should of course remain mindful of the continuities between 1600 and now and i write a lot about this but we should also keep in mind the discontinuities that had that the it was hoped that Kirby's life the negotiation of the law of the sea would bring about it turns out that that was not the case right so the 1982 agreement was the reason it's seen as a third world victory is a lot to do with politics it has a lot to do with the ways in which it was renounced or reneged on by western interests who were not even though they end up controlling quite a lot of the outcome were not happy that with with what was finally agreed because it didn't 100% accord with what they wanted but uh, and so because they walked away from it it has been left uh, in the uh, to be seen as a kind of all right the developing world was quite happy with it because they clearly signed on to it uh, it's the it's the west that was not happy with it that's the narrative we need to actually challenge so i completely agree with you i'm not trying to say that this was you know uh, something that the, the third world brought about and has nothing to do with western interests i'm saying we should just see where we need to focus what we need to look at when we try to think about the chronology of this and what we look at in terms of major turning points and where the where the shift began to happen we need to perhaps work a little bit further backwards in time and not see 94 is the break or even 82 is the break but think about the breaks that happened in the in the mid 70s for example in in the context of documents that are often dismissed as too technical as to be of any a particular interest that actually they encapsulate the political struggles of the time very well okay thank you for your long answer and and i do understand the point made made by yourself and Uh, especially what remains extremely interesting is that I mean in here at least at Jindal we have access to one on one accounts by professor Ad Eric who was in fact a part of these negotiations so we are privy to the discussions which took place during the negotiations and how it worked it is most interesting remains and you in fact touch upon this in your article also uh, these caucuses work and how when tommy co took over then how they, this became an open secret i mean everybody knew that these caucuses were operating but then of course they were admitted and understood and the underlying reasons for also for for them was also appreciated right uh, i have professor tripathi now who will uh, ask her question live thank you uh good evening dr ranganathan it's such a pleasure to see you again um i think i was transported back to cambridge to all our enlightening lectures um just a quick uh, input that i would say that i think my perspective of international law and the politics behind it i can definitely give all the credit to dr ranganathan and professor ben ben venesti so um it's such a pleasure and thank you so much i'm so glad that you could come here and um it's an opportunity for our students as well to kind of hear your insightful perspective uh just i think uh, a while back we had uh, professor oral coming over here and you know talking about you know the ilc and uh, the evolution and i think this is a question that you know one has asked in different ways is that in 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 the rising challenges of climate change and you know the multitude of issues that are arising how do you see uh, you know uh, the unclose you know playing a role and you know maybe possible changes that you know or that need to be uh, addressed in the, the umbrella structure of the unclos uh this is something that i would like your perspective on absolutely so firstly it's wonderful to see you akriti and looking so well and congratulations on your new position at jindal that's thank you so much professor uh and i hope you're enjoying the the, the shift from from student to teacher uh, that that you've made this year 
Uh, and thank you. This was this is a great question, right? This is in fact it's in a way the question of our times, right? What to, to what extent? Given that, so okay, there are many things to say, but let me begin with saying the first thing that we should all find extremely mystifying, right? When you go to these DBNJ negotiations or you go to CBA negotiations, the one thing that really doesn't get talked about, except by the NGOs that are present there, is climate change. It is often, you know, IUCN or one of the other NGOs that have to put their hands up and say, well, at least there should be some mention of the, you know, the term itself in the text of the treaty, even the, you know, the, even the term is not being mentioned, let alone any actual provisions being made. So there is this huge question. At the same time, uh, states are very happy to then go out into the world and say, oh, well, you know, we are, of course, taking climate change very seriously. We're even negotiating a new oceans treaty, and that's going to look at these issues. So there's a kind of disjunct between the kind of public discourse and what gets discussed, right? So climate change remains quite a marginal or absent sort of phenomenon in the context of the negotiations themselves. But in terms of what changes are needed, right? Now, some changes are, of course, practical changes. And something that uh, Professor Oral and the ILC is working on is what happens with sea level rise, right? How do we think of sea statehood in the context of the loss of territory? Uh, in some cases, total, but in many cases, significant or, you know, partial. Uh, so those are sort of the, they are the sort of questions that those are problems that have to be resolved. There is beyond that, however, a whole set of questions about what does climate change mean for the broader imaginaries that have been locked into place by treaties like the UNCLOS and a whole bunch of other treaties, right? To what extent can we keep on talking in terms of blue growth or even the blue economy when actions in the ocean, the consequences of which we don't even fully understand yet, can actually have a huge uh, sort of blowback effect, even in terms of how they facilitate, how they actually then can, you know, sort of, in terms of the feedback loop, how they accelerate climate change, right? So one of the big concerns around seabed mining is we don't actually know what the ecological implications will be, not just for life in the ocean, but also in terms of altering the Earth's ecosystems, right? What about all the, what, I mean, there's, there are concerns, we've also seen this in the context of the Arctic and so on, melting ice might release huge amounts of methane in the atmosphere, and that's not just an effect of climate change, that is going to be a cause of climate change, right? So there's a complex way in which the ocean, sea ice, uh, sea waters have served, the, or the oceans themselves have served as a kind of controller of the Earth's ecosystems. Uses of the ocean that are being planned and that are envisaged in the UNCLOS that are being planned through the subsequent agreements with the UNCLOS don't necessarily take into account most of this information. And the reason they don't is because this information has the capacity to interfere in a very radical way with some of the plans for extraction, right? So states are again, this is again the unfortunate fact of international negotiations. There is a lot of talk about the environment, there's a lot of talk about ways in which environmental concerns can be met through law. There's a lot of use of euphemistic language, right? Language around environmental impact assessments, language around area-based management tools. It's not clear though that these any of these do beyond assuaging people's fears whether they do what they're meant to do. So there is the sort of there's going to be the sort of immediate questions that have to be resolved. What will statehood look like in the context of climate change? What happens to the very large numbers of people who are, going, who are already being displaced and who will be displaced because of climate change, but also what happens to our imaginations of extraction, of making use of natural resources in the context of climate change. The people, there is, we know already groups of people, including some of Silicon Valley investors who are seeing climate change itself as an opportunity to do more with the sea, right? So the sea steading project is this idea of building habitats in the ocean on the basis that land will be at a premium and people will move to live in the sea. Sea steads, which are artificially constructed cities, can maybe become the equivalent of what Bombay is today or what other port cities are, right? So they are clearly looking at this as an economic opportunity. What this means to the rest of the world is problematic, right? Because for some groups can, can build these little panic rooms or can build themselves these little escape hatches. That's not for the rest of the world. So the question of how climate change and ongoing uh, work on the ocean should come together to unsettle some of these certainties uh, of the 50s and 60s against which these conventions were negotiated is a burning question.
Thank you so much, Dr. Rangnathan. I think it just points towards there's a lot of um, uncomfortable situations um, and people in their cushy chairs will have to rise to the occasion. And here's hoping that's the end of that. Here's hoping. And we must say, look at the fact that actually the precedent for making radical changes is also in the law of the sea. So the 1994 agreement was a pretty remarkable change of what was agreed in 1982 not seen at the time as undermining or as reneging on or as departing from what the 82 agreement has been. So we know that there is, it, it's perfectly possible, uh, the language, legal language around what is radical and what is moderate shifts in terms, not according necessarily according to the substance of what is being agreed, but really according to how these things accord with the broader political economic uh, imaginary of the time, right? So what we need to see now is whether the same kind of shift can happen, not so much, it can happen in terms of shifting the political economic imagination and not just the, the language. Thank you so much, Professor. Professor, I, I don't see any other questions here. So uh, I'll thank you for for agreeing to take us take out time for us, for sharing your thoughts and your paper. Uh, it was an absolute delight and an honor for us to host you. And we look forward to possible collaborations with you and the center, Lotto Park Center. And thank you very much for speaking to us today, Professor. We're honored. Thank, thank you for having me. It's a pleasure. See you soon, thank Professor. You. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye. Bye.